Welcome to Dreamers, Believers and High Achievers. My name is David C. Lee. Each episode, we bring you an inspiring person with an incredible message to help you turn your dreams into reality and unlock the high achiever within you. Thank you for spending some time with me today. And now off to the show. Have you got your copy of my latest book, Capture Your Dreams and Smash Your Fears? In it, you will rediscover your self-esteem and belief in yourself. You'll learn how to harness the fear and power of change. You'll learn how to achieve more, earn more, and be more in all aspects of life and discover what success truly means to you. You can get your copy on Amazon Books, Kindle, and Audible, or you can also go to my website, David C. Lee, that's D-A-V-I-D-C-L-E-E.com, and grab your copy there. Tony Katara was born and raised to hard-working Italian parents in the outer suburb of Sydney, Australia. As with many children of immigrants, Tony inherited his parents' hard-working ethic. Tony graduated with a degree in business and later joined Harvey Norman, a large national retailer. After a few short years, he was promoted to general manager of their computer and communications division and increased their turnover from $12 million to a staggering $565 million. In 2002, Tony proved to be an early adopter in the coaching space by setting up his own coaching company with clients such as Cisco, Eldrie Electronics, Sanyo, as well as many other small and medium enterprises. Tony is known as someone that gets it done. Through his speaking and training products, Tony has helped countless businesses and individuals around the world achieve outstanding success. Tony is the author of highly successful books, Business Success and Sales Success, and has also co-authored and contributed to numerous other sales and marketing books. Welcome to the show, Tony. Thanks, David. Thanks for having me. Tony, can you tell us something really interesting from your childhood? I used to stutter a lot. I'm a professional speaker, and um, when I was 14, uh, up until the age of 14, I was absolutely the worst speaker you have ever seen in your entire life. (laughs) I used to stutter so much. It was unbelievable. So how did you get around it? How did you uh, cope that? Obviously, if you're thinking about the career that you've taken and uh, and been so successful at, it wouldn't have been a good attribute. Yeah, I don't know. I, I think over time, David, it just left. Um, I think uh, I was very much teased at it by school uh, mm-hmm. because everyone used to say, Tony, okay? Okay. And it, it, it really uh, did, in many ways, uh, shape my early uh, childhood and um, it, it allowed me. But I think what happened is that I decided to uh, challenge myself by getting involved in the school debating team. And I, I think in many ways that over a period of time, I, from practice, I just became more comfortable speaking. Amazing. Yeah, you've actually uh, you just hit it head on and, and tackled it. That's awesome. Tony, as a general manager of a major retailer, you took Harvey Norman Computer and Communications from $12 million to a staggering $565 million in sales. Can you tell us about that? Uh, yeah, it's a, it, honestly, it's a very interesting story. David, I, when I was going to university, I was working for a gentleman who was running a department in Walton's. Walton's was a department store in Sydney mm-hmm. that's no longer going anymore. Okay. And we kept it, we kept in contact. And then one day he rings me up out of the blue and he says, um, Tony, I'm working for this maverick retailer called Jerry Harvey. And he's set up a company, and this was in the early 80s, David, mm-hmm. called okay. Harvey Norman Discounts which was essentially a competitor to a company that he uh, grew that he got kicked out of called Norman Ross. And um, he got kicked out of that because Alan Bond bought out Norman Ross and I think Jerry and him didn't see eye to eye. So he said, uh, if I can't be part of you, I'll beat you. So essentially he created a competitor called Harvey Norman Discounts and that's how Harvey Norman came about. Mm-hmm. And okay. this was way back in the eighties, and um, and you know, and, and and I really already had a job. I wasn't looking for a job, but I was doing some part-time work consultancy, and I was, you know, the typical 
31 or, or I, was, I was actually 27 years old and I had all these, mm-hmm. you know, I had a degree in marketing. So I felt that I knew how to, to create a marketing business plan. So mm-hmm. this guy rings up and says, Tony, how about you do this? Why don't you write a report for Harvey Norman about how they can get into computers? Okay. Okay. Yeah. And being back in the eighties as well. Yeah, back in the eighties, and you know, like mm. we, we're selling computers at the moment, but you know, it's all very small and Mickey Mousey, and you know, we're selling Commodore Vic twenties, and you know, it, it <laughs> wasn't a big division. In fact, it was considered to be a joke of a division in Harvey Norman because the real powerhouse okay. was furniture and electrical. Okay, mm-hmm. and, and computers was relatively small, and it wasn't even considered to, to be worthy to be a franchise. So it was part of the small appliance franchising um, Mm -hmm, division. mm -hmm. Um, And and so effectively, when you bought a PC in Harvey Norman at that stage, you went through toasters and, you know, and 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 you got to the computer department. So that's how how badly it was considered. Mm -hmm. So I wrote this report, David, and and honestly, it it was just a horrible report if I read it now. Um, It was full of (laughs) spelling mistakes. It was way too long. It was 140 pages that said the same old stuff all the time. (laughs) It it had concepts from marketing textbooks that I had read during my Mm -hmm. marketing degree. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I I met Jerry Harvey and, you know, part of the deal was we're not going to pay you, Tony, but uh, we will, you will be able to present it to Jerry Harvey. And he was considered to be famous even at that stage as a maverick retailer. Mm-hmm. So I presented it to Jerry Harvey. He, uh, he, you know, he, he read the report. He told me all about the spelling mistakes and typical <laughs> charismatic character that he is, very direct. And, um, and he said to me, um, why don't you do it? And I said, no, 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 I don't want to do it, Jerry. I've already got a job. I said, no, 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 why don't you do it? And it was quite convincing. And I really didn't want to go into retail because I okay. was working for Johnson and Johnson at that stage, and that was considered to be the icon of marketing. Okay, so yeah, yeah. Um, going into a discount department store wasn't considered to be an aspirational move. Mm, mm. But I, I, I joined Harvey Norman, and um, and I, I, it was at a cusp, and mm-hmm. I was probably there. Um, and I don't really have a lot of talents, but um, I was there at the right place at the right time. And okay. what happened is that computers started to grow. There was this, there was a shift. At that stage, every personal computer sold in Australia was sold through a computer dealer. Okay, mm-hmm. so you would go to an mm-hmm. individual store that sold computers. Mm-hmm. Harvey Norman challenged that model. It fundamentally said that we, as a retailer, will sell a personal computer seven days a week, and we will also give the client the opportunity of buying that computer, which was quite expensive at that stage. The average price of a computer was about $3,000. So that wasn't a small amount of money in those days. Absolutely. And we would allow the consumer to buy that product Mm interest-free. And Mm -hmm. it, it just went off. Um, you know, I think in the first year we went from 12 million to about 30 million. And then what happened is that we opened up computer superstores, which were these huge monster stores that had wall to wall computers and software and printers. And they were quite large stores. The first Mm -hmm. kind in Australia, no one else had a computer superstore at that stage. And we became so dominant that we opened up about 60 or 70 of these computer superstores. Mm-hmm. And Harvey Norman almost instantaneously was transformed. The computer share that was around about 3% of the total business at Harvey Norman, it mm-hmm. became the largest single division of Harvey Norman. It's the market share of Harvey Norman selling computers was a massive 80% of every computer sold in retail was sold through a Harvey Norman outlet. Phenomenal. And not only that, uh, because Harvey Norman was a publicly listed company, the share price of Harvey Norman absolutely escalated because it was considered to be a cutting-edge retailer selling the very sexy technology 
as opposed to furniture, for example. Mm. Mm. So it really mm, fundamentally transformed the nature of Harvey Norman. And um, I was very fortunate to be there for 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, and it was a wonderful experience of massive growth on growth on growth. So uh, yeah. that's a little bit about the story of Harvey Norman. That's incredible. Obviously, there's a, a little bit of luck there, right time, right place. But you know, luck can luck can only get you so far. Obviously, there's a lot of talent there to keep building it and building it and building it. But yeah, that is an incredible, incredible story. But I, I think, in many ways, the reason that Harvey Norman was so successful is because we had a single focus, mm -hmm. and you've got to realise that we were not welcome in the computer marketplace. In fact, I had huge battles with suppliers even giving me stock. We were wow. considered to be, uh, it was very much a lockout situation. So I had to take secondary brands like mm -hmm. Amstrad and Olivetti. And mm -hmm. at that stage, the big brands were IBM, Compact and Apple. And over time, each one of those brands came to us and said, Tony, you know what? We don't like you. We don't like your model. We don't like your trading terms. But you know what? We can't afford not to do business with you. And mm -hmm. as soon as Harvey Norman was able to establish uh, the big free brands in their, in their stores, we, we became very dominant because the brands gave us the credibility to actually touch into not only the home market, but the small business marketplace. That sounds very similar to, to Uber, to Tesla, and so many other people that, uh, and companies that have really disrupted the market. Yeah, it was very much a disruption strategy. We, we, we were hated. Mm. We, honestly, we were hated. I, I remember seeing ads and, you know, I remember getting booed at the stage when I went to an Apple conference because Apple dealers were there. Okay. Wow. Uh, there, was, there wasn't um, a lot of love in the dealer land for Harvey Norman because we were fundamentally taking share. Um, mm -hmm. okay. And we were very aggressive. We were advertising every weekend. We were advertising on TV. And mm -hmm. I call it something we were changing the ant trail. You know, the ant trail mm -hmm. is the mm -hmm. way people traditionally buy products. Yeah. And yeah. we were changing the fundamental way that people were buying those products. Tony, throughout your career, you've invested heavily in self-education through coaching, seminars, courses, uh, mentorships, masterminds, etc. Some people see this as a cost, but I believe it's crucial to invest in yourself. What's your thoughts on it? I think, you know, I, you know, I think there's an old saying, learners are earners. Mm. And um, I, I have a great joy out of learning. I don't do it solely because it helps my business. I do it because I genuinely believe that it keeps one youthful. Mm. I mm. fundamentally believe that you always want to stay attached to the branch. Yeah. Um, and I think the branch is a lot about learning and legacy. And I think a lot of people uh, sometimes get into rut because they're not growing. And I continue, even at this stage at 59, to invest in my own personal development on a daily basis. Um, yes. It is part of the recipe that I have. It is part of my daily ritual. So for yes. me, I can only assure you it has opened up my world. Um, so much so, David, that I have worked in four different industries at a mm -hmm. senior level. Mm -hmm. Each one of those industries, I knew nothing about the business before mm -hmm. I joined. And yes. each one of those industries, within the space of six months, I was able to successfully make a significant business difference in that industry. Yeah. And I put it down to one reason, um, because I understood the principles of how to run the business. I didn't actually have to know the specifics of what to do each day because there were people there to do that. Yes. And I would say that those principles not only came from Harvey Norman, but came from reading all of that knowledge and going to those seminars and understanding that they were very important principles that applied to any business, any successful business. And the key was applying those in, in an existing business. There's a tar, that phrase as well, leaders are readers. Yes. And yeah, your self-education, as soon as you stop educating yourself, you stop 
growing and growth in nature is a natural thing. I mean, we all know the stories of people who have been in, in, in a job, been in a career for 40 years, 50 years, whatever the case may be, retire and six months later, unfortunately, they've passed away. They've just completely taken themselves away from business, from learning, from people and think, you know, think oh, wow, well, I'm going to be retiring and get a, a chair by the river and do some fishing. And then six months later, we lose them because they stop feeding themselves. They stop that growth. Yeah, and I think it's a really big issue. I, I think that, you know, I, I don't think we retire. I think we transform. Um, mm, and I think yeah. you've got to continue to actually reinvent yourself. And that can be quite challenging because change management is never easy. And uh, as you get a little bit older, you tend to be a little bit more timid about those things because of the fear of loss. Um, yes. But you actually realise it is an exciting journey because at the end of the day, it's life. And that is the essence of life. And, you know, we've all heard the stories and I've read countless books about, you know, people who have, have only got six months to live. And, um, and, and they asked them, you know, like, is there a regret? And, and it wasn't spending more time um, at the workplace that they were at. Hmm. A lot of it had to do with involvement and relationships. Yes. But the big one is that I should have taken more risks. Okay, I didn't give life a go. And they see their own finality in their own life and their greatest regrets is that the regret they should have tried more things and experimented more in life. And I think they're very valuable lessons because I don't think we take anything with us. And uh, we're great hoarders, but I think we need to be great producers. Yeah, well said. I completely agree with that, uh, Tony. I even break it down to the day, as in what can I get done today so that 9.30, 10 o'clock, whatever time I go to bed, I know that I've gone to bed doing everything I could that day. <laughs> it, it, it may be a little bit maniacal by, by some people's thoughts, but I just want to get the most I can out of every day, out of every second of life. I don't really want to retire and then sit by the river and then forget about life. <laughs> but then again, some people that is, I've got a, a friend and his aim in life, his goal in life was to live in a log cabin by a lake, do some fishing, do some hunting. He does that good on him, but it's not for me. And it's not for, it's not for a lot of entrepreneurs. Yeah. And I think how you define success is based on your own value system. If somebody Absolutely. says, I, um, I want to get home and spend time with my kids and be there at 4.30 every afternoon, and they've achieved that, then in my book, they're successful. We, we have mm, a society that really, that really tends to favour financial success at all costs. Mm, but mm. that is not everybody's variable in life. And we no. actually have to realise that one's life goals are their goals they're not other people's goals That's and right. um we and, and and unfortunately we compare and comparison is not healthy in life not at all because that comparison creates envy jealousy and sometimes you don't focus your true calling in life because mm. you take on someone else's calling and i see it all the time i see miserable people who supposedly by world standards are successful but they're either drug addicts or drunks. Completely agree. Business and, and entrepreneurship and life that we're speaking about now, so much of it is about, uh, about the person's inner game, their mindset. Uh, you, like, like most um, high achievers, you like to take care of yourself physically. What are your thoughts on the mind-body connection when it comes to overall success in life? It's a good question, David. I didn't always look after myself. Um, first of all, I um, at I was when I was fifty one, I was one hundred and seven kilos. So wow. I was I was a fat short Italian. Um, <laughs> but I had I had a life event. Um, mm -hmm. I got divorced after twenty seven mm -hmm. years of marriage, Oof, and tough. I woke up. Um, first of all, I wanted to get remarried, but I needed to package myself again because mm -hmm. I look pretty unattractive. So I, I'm going to myself, well, who's going to marry a fat 50-year-old? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so I started to run marathons, Okay. Um, which is pretty weird because, you know, a marathon is 42 kilometres and I'd never run a marathon before. And I did my first marathon when I was 52 years old. 
yeah, I continued to run marathons and I got really, really lean. And then I studied health and nutrition because I had an interest in it because I could see the transformation in my own body. And then I started to uh, really understand it wasn't just about exercise. A lot of it, well, 80% of it was about nutrition. Mm, so I started definitely. nutrition and, and, and really studied that. And uh, right now, I would probably say I'm 59. I'm the fittest I've ever been. Mm -hmm. uh, I am still doing, I'm doing half marathons now. So mm -hmm. I've got my next half marathon, which is the Central Coast Half Marathon in Sydney. And mm -hmm. that okay. is in June. And I will do five half marathons this year. Um, oh, and I will, and I tend to work out every day and mm -hmm. I enjoy working out every day. How has it helped me? Um, it's giving me balance. It's allowed a vehicle of, um, in many ways, uh, peace and serenity. Mm -hmm. I find exercise incredibly enjoyable and I understand uh, how to drive maximum energy through nutrition. Mm. And uh, I value sleep. Uh, I never used to value sleep so much, but I've understood implicitly the benefits of health. And look, honestly, David, you know, everyone can have lots of stuff, but if you don't have your health, mate, it's a zero sum game. Um, exactly. You, you know, and, and that is the tragedy. The tragedy is that if you don't look after yourself, then effectively your life will be limited. And not only uh, where you can have an early death, but the health that you have in your senior years could be quite challenged. Yes, there is so much research coming out now in relation to sleep. And, you know, the old, uh, the old entrepreneurs of, you know, oh, I get by with four hours sleep a night. That's not good. It's been scientifically proven. It's not good. And nutrition again. And as you said, uh, you know, with, with our lifespan increasing, increasing, increasing. So, I mean, I would love to live to 100 years old, but I want to live to 100 years old when I'm active and I can function. And by looking after yourself, both physically and nutrition now, as science goes forward, when we get older and older, there's going to be new science come in and then we can increase our lifespan to perhaps 100 years old and have a good life. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, and I think we're both on the same page about the, the aspects of health and nutrition. And when I coach business owners, it's really interesting, David. Uh, I'm now part of Action Coaching, which is about a 1,000 business coaches around the world and mm -hmm. it's really interesting you know um there's an old proverb a business is a reflection of the owner and you know mm, everyone thinks oh, you've got to fix up the business and all that sort of stuff i don't honestly between me i work on the owner and so much of the owner is not only changing their mindset but changing their entire philosophy about how they operate in their own life you know, a lot of business owners, they work the most and earn the least. They don't have any boundaries. They don't know how to delegate really well because they're control freaks. Yeah. Uh, no one can do yeah. it like themselves. They very, have very little understanding of the true financial nature of their business. And, and realistically, uh, in many ways, you actually have to work on them uh, first. And as you work mm. on them, the foundation of the business becomes a lot stronger and then you can build it on top of that which is predominantly the systems the marketing the sales and the team so uh, and i see a lot of that and a lot of it is also about getting their health in order too about mm, look mm. i think you should be drinking you know two liters of water a day uh yes. really you've got to you've got to stop drinking so much alcohol it's probably not the wisest thing in the world to do um, and because ultimately you can actually see that they're suffering burnout and burnout is a very real philosophy, uh, especially as one gets older, we all know what to do. We just don't want to do it because we're tired. Mm. Um, yep. And we just hit that, we just hit that wall and that wall is, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, I know what to do. I know how to build my business. I know how to build my career, but you reach a point of exhaustion. And the only thing I can say is life is not a sprint. It's a marathon. It is well said, very well said, completely agree. Tony, the, the number one priority 
for any business or entrepreneur is obviously sales. Without sales, there's no business. But so many people get the red mist. They clam up when it's time to close a sale. What advice can you give on that? Change your mindset. I personally believe, and this happened to me, um, I got into sales by default because I started my own business. Mm -hmm. And I realized that if I didn't know how to sell, I would be broke. And I was one of those amazing people that was trying to live a lifestyle that I had in the corporate world when I started my first business, which I successfully did. But the only reason I was able to do that is because I started to change my outlook on selling. And I thought selling was something sinister, manipulative, highly yeah. aggressive, all yeah. of those qualities that go with a traditional view of sales that maybe sometimes comes from a media or a movie that we watch where there is some high pressure, deceptive salesperson. Yes. And then I really came to the conclusion that selling is nothing more than helping people buy. And mm. people like to buy stuff. They do. You know, we have churches in Australia called Westfields. We actually have, you know, <laughs> the shopping God, you know, shop to your drop. And not only that, um, selling is about helping people to solve their problems. And mm. so essentially you're a problem solver. And when I started to change my mindset and said, okay, my role is to help people to solve their problems, then my natural inclination for passion, enthusiasm, and really asking deep questions shone because I genuinely, genuinely like helping people. And everybody said, you're an amazing salesperson. It's not. I'm just innately curious about how I can help them. And through that, I become a great salesperson. The days of walking into a store or a showroom and being greeted by a salesperson with dollar signs in their eyes are gone. I mean, people now are so educated that they can tell when someone is just trying to get the sale or when they're being insincere in trying to get the sale. So yeah, I've found that so many people and the number one thing to success in sales is to be authentic, be yourself and to help the person. Yeah, very much so. And and that's what I really teach. I, you know, I want you to be transparent and authentic and, and genuine and, and, and ask really good questions. You know, everyone used to think, oh, well, you've got to have the gift of the gap. It's a lie. Um, the real true success of a sales professional is the ability to engage with a prospect by having conversations and asking deep questions um, and continuing to ask those questions. So essentially, you're not talking, but you are in your active listening and that mm. shows that you care because mm. people don't know how much you, people don't care how much you know until you show them how much you care. Yes, and so absolutely. much of the sales industry is still driven by the commission, driven mm. by the quick sale, driven by uh, what you can do for me. You will get the commission, okay, as a result of doing your job correctly, but not the reason you do it. It's hmm. a, an outcome of doing your job correctly. Uh, and and you know, that's, what, that's what I say to people. If you're in it for the money and that's all you want, then maybe you should get out of it. Maybe you should do something you really care about and the money will come to you. Yeah, exactly. The the days of, of the uh, the salespeople or the salesperson going back into the back room after they've put a deal together and high-fiving and, and whooping about, oh, look, I've got another sale, I've got another sale, and then they completely forget the follow-up. They've got that sale. That's all they want to do. They've got the, the contract signed, and then they completely forget about the follow-up. The other person comes in, the successful, the future successful salesperson comes in, rings the bell, goes through the, through the traditions, but then make sure that he follows up or she follows up with the, with the client. Make sure that they get onto their um, Christmas cards, their, their anniversary cards, keeps in touch with them, gives them really, really good up-to-date information on the uh, the industry that it is, whether it be cars, homes, or computers, or whatever the case may be, but they genuine in their love of what they do and helping people. Yeah, you've, you've hit it right on the head, absolutely. Tony, you uh, with your work as a coach, you've helped your clients obtain some incredible success. What do you believe is the number one barrier that stops most 
entrepreneurs from gaining the success they're really capable of? It's a good question. A lack of focus. Mm -hmm. I think great successful entrepreneurs need to have a laser-like focus. And that laser-like focus is you've got to stop chasing the shiny balls. <laughs> yeah. And the shiny balls are, oh, gee, that's a good idea. That's a good idea. That's a good idea. And it's very easy for us to dismiss what is good and bad, but it's harder to dismiss what is great versus good. And we mm. sometimes think something is good is going to be great, and it never is. It's never meant to be part of our overall agenda, but we get distracted. So I would say distraction. I mm -hmm. would certainly say chasing shiny balls. And another one that seems to be evident is a you need to have a healthy discontent with the present if you want to be successful entrepreneurs. You mm -hmm. have to have a burning desire to change something. And you've mm. noticed it before, Uber, even Harvey Norman, when we're at Harvey Norman, we were building a business because we felt that was an injustice in that area. Um, you know, Uber was to break the stronghold of taxis. Uh, mm -hmm. Richard mm. Branson was to break the stronghold of British Airways when he had yes. originally started Virgin. So essentially, there has to be some sort of cause. And I think you've got to actually establish why you're doing what you're doing. And I think one of the things that you need to have is you need to have a bold vision. And the vision mm -hmm. isn't about making money. It's something that gets you out of bed every single day that will continue to drive you even when the shit hits the fan, even yes. when yes. it gets tough, even when you say, why am I doing this? That is to me a very important criteria to drive success. It is. Tony, as we're coming towards the end of the interview, one question I really want to ask is, we all face fear. What is your way of, of you controlling the fear that everyone feels so that it doesn't control you? All right, well, first of all, I think you have to admit that there is fear. And fear is a healthy thing because fear in many ways will save your life because a fear of actually walking across the road when there is traffic on the road is a good fear. Hmm. And hmm. fear is a biological uh, response uh, to, to, to an attack. And hmm. it, it saved us, you know, in caveman days. So it's actually a very, very good thing. But fear is also can be dangerous because it exemplifies anxiety. And um, there's an acronym for fear called false evidence appearing real. Mm. And I would say that no other time in our society have I seen so much fear. Um, there has been an enormous amount of fear that has been created by the media. Mm. Mm. There has been an enormous amount of fear that has been created by the last two years where we all know, David, that media outlets are only concerned in one thing. Eyeballs lead to cash. So yes. negative news is much more successful than positive news. So I amplify negative news. I create fear in the society, and that fear creates procrastination. What else does it create? It creates timidity, and it creates doubt. And I think the only way that I believe that you can change that is you've got to make a choice to turn down the volume, okay? Mm. There's an old mm. proverb, you can't soar like an eagle when you hang around with the turkeys. Mm. I think mm. you've got to be in communities like yourself uh, where you're actually listening to positive messages and positive people, okay? So effectively, I think you need to set boundaries around... Uh, how you protect your mind. We, we go to great efforts to protect our body. You know, we all know the, the benefits of health and nutrition. But realistically, what are you feeding your mind? And I believe that so much of the mental health issues in Australia, in the world, are created because we are almost having junk food of fort life. And that fort life <laughs> is then terminating into a response which could lead to depression and anxiety. 
Yes. There's, there is no doubt that with Or, I mean, I'm blessed to be able to call a lot of successful entrepreneurs friends. I'm blessed to have some incredible guests such as yourself on on this show. And one of the number one things that they do is exactly what you've just said. They protect their mind. They protect what goes in. They protect themselves from the six o'clock news spouting disaster, calamity. They yeah. protect themselves. And people have even said to me, well, David, what, what happens if something happens that you really should know about? I said, look, if there's something that really should know about, I will know about it. People will let me know. But to actually sit there and devour the, the 6 p.m. news and to sit at the computer and every 15 minutes check to see what's happening on NBC, CNN or, or whatever, wherever you are in the world, whatever your local news service is. It's damaging to your health. It's damaging to your mental health. It will bring you down. It will cause depression. It will cause anxiety. It's uh, it's incredible that people don't realize that. Yeah, and unfortunately, it's it's not going to diminish. I don't think the media is going to say, "Hey, we're going to come off all these negative stories." They're just going to find something else to focus in on. Um, Mm, It's mm. just it's just been one incident after. It's been floods. It's been COVID. Now it's the war in Russia and Ukraine and. You know, now, you know, it's just all the negativity that goes on with that, okay, is an mm-hmm. ongoing basis. It never ceases. Exactly. Tony, I've had an absolute ball today. I've, I've really, really enjoyed our conversation. I want to thank you for sharing so much today. But, Tony, as we come to the end of the, uh, end of the interview, end of our chat, what parting piece of advice or resource can you give? And where can we learn more about your fantastic work? If I was to give you a parting thing is that I, at 59, David, I'm trying to do four things in my life. And this is the my life philosophy. And I'm not actually telling any of the listeners to take on my life philosophy. But I think you've got to have a life philosophy to live by. And I'll just share mine because all I want is the listeners to do is start thinking about theirs because you sometimes you have to really dig deep in your life to really ask you the question is, why am I on earth? And to me, it was four things. It's to live. And when I talk live, it's enjoying the moment, not chasing the next ball, just enjoying the simplicity of life as easy as a a wonderful conversation with your love partner to love and love is the relationship of humanity. And that is the love that we give to others and the love we receive ourselves and accepting that love from others um, is sometimes very difficult for entrepreneurs. So to live, to love, to learn, which is really big for me, and we've talked about that before. Mm, And number four to me is to leave a legacy. So I actually operate in those four quadrants. Mm -hmm. To live, to love, to learn, to leave a legacy. And that has helped me to adjust myself because sometimes I see myself doing one too much. And I actually have to then remember the four L's. Now, if your listeners are incredibly excited by what they actually hear, all I would strongly suggest is that um, they can go to, I am part of Action Coach. So I'm part of Action Coach Parramatta. But I think that um, on if they are, I'm doing a free workshop which is a real workshop. It's actually physically uh, in Parramatta. It's at a hotel Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it's on the 31st of May. And it's predominantly a workshop where I unpack how to build a successful business. Okay, so what I do is I take all the wisdom that I've had from decades of experience and I show incredibly how you would build a commercial profitable enterprise that can work without you. So all they really have to do is just contact myself. I'm all over Google. Just type in Mm -hmm. Tony Guitari and you will find me. You'll find LinkedIn, Facebook, 
and you know if you if you seek you will find so um and they can just get in contact with me i can they can come here and all that sort of stuff and the only other thing is that i genuinely have a desire to help business owners so if there are any business owners that do need help no strings attached i don't charge anything I'm more than happy to sit down with them and just really go through a business workshop for them and their business about what they can do to really build that business. Um, so those are a couple of things that I can do. So, you know, I'm there genuinely. I'm at an age in my life where I like to give back. It's not about the money. It's about serving others. Thank you so much, Tony, for being with us today. Thank you so much for that parting piece of wisdom, and what an incredible, incredible offer that Tony has given us. I'm going to have the links to Tony's resources that he mentioned and some of the value gems that he shared on the show today. And believe me, I'm sure that you agree with me, he has delivered so many value gems. They'll be on the show notes for the episode. Friends, we all have a choice, success or excuses. It's clearly your decision. Until next time, bye for now. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Dreamers, Believers, and High Achievers. We hope you found today's discussion impactful. To help support the show and allow us to reach as many people as possible, we'd love if you could pass this along to at least two friends or family members to help them achieve greatness in their own lives. You can also visit davidclee.com for more information and resources to help you take your life to new heights, as well as connect with David directly on social media 